Hey guys, welcome back. Schizone series, episode seven. Topic today is fractions. Great topic. Actually, a bit of a gateway drug topic because I really can't think of very many engineering problems that don't involve fractions or continuous variables like you know 1.3, negative 5.6, pi, square root of three, you know, the numbers between the numbers. So yeah, today's episode is gonna be about how we can represent fractions, different ways to do that, some of the pros and cons of each way. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. So let's get into it. So here is the, starting off just with very basics here, just for a refresher, it leads into future content. So I'm doing it this way. So map needs to tell Dora that the castle is five, kilometers north but he doesn't remember the mexican word for five but thankfully dora understands binary encoding and so typically how we would represent five in binary is we'd count from right to left the lowest bit would be on the right that'd be two to the zero and we would basically populate this number flipping these switches such that the zeroth and the second bit are high so the total is five pretty simple um but it gets a little bit more complicated when you have to add more than just positive numbers into the mix. So positive whole numbers, I should say. So here's the next problem statement. Map got a little bit turned around and actually the castle is 5K south, not north. And he doesn't know the Chilean word for south and Dora is expecting a distance north. So how can we communicate negative five to Dora? Well, a couple of different options. Sometimes it's best to have a sign bit, just have a bit that's maybe on the far left, the highest bit, most significant bit, or anywhere you want it to be really, just that it indicates that this number is negative. So basically if this was zero, this would be positive five. And if it's one, it would be negative five. That's the, that's the approach. You could also have a sign integer via some kind of complement. So typically the way the boomer set this up is basically um, you divide your range in half. So you have half the positive numbers and half the negative numbers that you would all, otherwise had all positive numbers. Now you have half positive, half negative. And basically you start counting that the biggest number, one, 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 all ones is negative one. And then you just kind of count backwards from that. And there are tricks like two's complement and whatever else it's called to, to do that kind of stuff. But uh, ultimately, you're just basically counting backwards from the biggest number and the biggest number is negative one. That's, so everything wraps around, you know? And, and that's why addition and subtraction still work when you have sign integers using like this kind of complement. So that, that's cool, right? Otherwise, you could have some kind of custom data type. Maybe you want to be able to encode other directions too. Maybe map wants to encode east and west as well as north and south. And so maybe you dedicate two bits to communicating north, south, east, and west. That's an option. There's so many different ways to do things. It's all up, all up to you. That's the beauty of like low-level computing is that you can kind of do whatever you want. Uh, and no one can tell you otherwise. So pretty cool stuff. Now that's negative numbers and basically the, the message is that you can do whatever you want with your bits you can choose i mean if you wanted to you could make five the other way you could have the least significant bit beyond the far left right you could count you have everything backwards it's up to you do whatever you want i mean whatever suits your problem at hand right so you have so much flexibility to do whatever you need to do next problem statement now at this point Dora, Map, Backpack, maybe Boots the Monkey. <laughs> Is that his name? Uh, they walk closer toward the castle. So how can Map let Dora know that they're, they're closer? They're now half a kilometer away. And so, well, how would you do that? There's so many different ways. How would you communicate a fraction to Dora using just these switches on and off? Well, I can think of a couple dozen options. I'm going to just show you a few here on the next two slides, but there's, a, there's so many options that you could do for this. So the first one might just be, how about a flag? How about, you know, maps like, you know what? I typically only give her a couple of directions in terms of distance. Like your GPS says, you know, you know, turn, turn left in 1000 feet, turn left in 
half a kilometer, right? There's only a few options, right? So why don't we encode every possible option as just a flag? So in this case, I have a, a, a flag bit. That means, hey, this number has flags in it. And basically, hey, if the lowest bit is high, that means I'm talking about half a mile or half a kilometer or whatever you're talking about half of. Um, if this bit, the third bit is high, that means a fifth, right? So this way you can communicate common fractions, common numbers. Hey, you can even do pi. This could be one over pi, this could be one over e, whatever numbers you want. You can, you can pick, it's up to you, right? You can encode those things as well. So basically, um, that's an option. And maybe you wanna be able to add more options. Hey, how about you, maybe you imply some kind of multiplication. What if you had this bit and, uh, and this bit both ones? Well, then maybe that means one-tenth of a, of a kilometer. And what if this was a one and this was a one? That would be one sixth of a kilometer. I don't know. It's just an idea. That might work, right? That's an option. You could do that. It might be a good solution for a certain problem. How about option two? You can just change the units, right? We're talking about kilometers here. Why don't we? Why don't we talk about meters or millimeters or hectometers? Half a kilometer is just five hectometers, right? So just encode five and change the unit. That works. How about you count things in paces? Yeah, I mean, how many steps you have to go? Then everything is integer, right? You don't take half a step, right? So just encode paces, right? That's what a mile is, you know, mile, meal, you know, a thousand, right? A, a thousand strides when you're running. Every stride is 5.28 feet, right? Hey, let's do that. Let's just encode things in terms of paces or strides. It's a good idea. Option three. How about we imply some denominator? How about we whisper to Dora, hey, Dora, take this number and divide it by some other number. number. How about number two? So then all we have to do is pass her a one in the register, and she knows, hey, I'll, I'll just take half of that. I'll divide by two. That's my implied denominator. And some people might think, okay, that, that's just fixed point numbers. Mm, in this case, it kind of is, but not in general, because I can pick any denominator I want. I can pick three. You can't do three in fixed point. I can pick pi. I can have any implied denominator I want here. That kind of goes back to the meme at the beginning, you know, that um, Yu-Gi-Oh meme. Pi over one is a, is, is a fraction, right? Technically. I just, you know, I just, in this case, I imply a numerator, but you could do whatever you want, right? You want to encode one of these numbers. Maybe you want to encode one and you imply pi as a numerator, I don't know, that's an option, right? So cool, that's an option, having an implied denominator. What are some other options? There's so many options. One more option would be, how about an encoded fraction? How about we take different parts of the, the register or of the bits, and we dedicate those to numerator versus denominator? So let's take the first two bits on the left, our numerator, and the last three are denominators. In this case, I'm encoding one as a numerator, and two as the denominator, so the number is a half. So I can encode any number. I can encode three quarters. I can encode zero sevenths, right? I can encode any number that I want in this uh, in this way. Maybe you want to have a few, a few more bits here for signs, a few more bits maybe for a whole number part of it. I don't know, up to you. You can pick whatever you want. It's your, your implementation, right? Another option would be fixed point. This is a, a very you know common way to do stuff. Maybe 40 years ago before they had floating point units in computers, um, but it's still good to this day. Basically, you are implying usually like a power of two denominator. So in this case, you can see I've um, basically I've placed a decimal point between the first three and the last two bits. So basically, normally if you go back. The lowest bit was two to the zero and the, the fifth bit was two to the fourth. But in this case, the lowest bit's actually two to the negative two and the highest one is two to the two. And so basically, I've just shifted the whole number to the left by two, giving me two binary decimal places to work with. And so in this case, you know, two to the one half, or sorry, two to the negative one is one half. And so this number encodes one half, but without any need for fractions. It's just a shifted point. That's why it's called fixed point because the decimal is here and not here. That's the idea. And the last option, 
might be floating point. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit in a second. And so I guess the moral of the story is, again, there's so many different options. You could have other implied expressions. When you imply a square root, maybe you imply a square root on part of the fraction. Maybe you, maybe you do multiple things. Maybe you have numerator, denominator, and fixed point, and you add everything together. Maybe you have subtraction. You could encode anything you want in binary. That's the beauty of, of this. Anything that you can think of, you can encode in just a mess of bits. These seven bits are numerator, and these 12 bits are you know, offsets, and this, you can pick whatever you want, it's up to you. And so, yeah, you can do whatever you want with your bits. Now, when it comes to floats, we're gonna talk about, in this series, I'm gonna stick predominantly with double precision floating point numbers. So I, I'm gonna call them a float, but I guess the, the C programming word would be double. But uh, yeah, they're basically the same thing. So it, we're talking about eight byte quantities that represent decimals, like 7.38. And the way that this works, I'm not going into too much detail on this because it's you could read this Wikipedia article yourself and, and know way more than what I'm gonna say. Basically, there's one bit for signs, 11 bits for the exponent, and uh, the fraction is encoded 52 bits, and there's like an implied uh, one in front. So you have, basically you have the ability to represent numbers across a huge amount of exponents. Like you can't get anywhere close to this with integers. Look, you can get to the power of three, negative 308, 10 to the 10 E negative 308 and 10 E positive 308. And even down to 324, if you don't care about your precision being so good. So that's an incredible ability to represent numbers that are super small and super huge. Why I don't like this is because it's almost a waste. Like, I'm an engineer and we don't go above like 10 to the 12th in my field. I work in mechanical engineering. And we go down to maybe like the the 10,000th of an inch, but we don't go down to 10 E negative 308. So yeah, you have all this ability, but it's kind of a waste. Like these exponent bits, you could have used them for precision instead you use them for shifting your number big and small so anyway it's a cool idea and you can read all about it and I'm, we're going to use it in a series like almost all the time because it's so easy um but uh there are other ways to do things that's the point of this video is to show you the other ways to implement similar things to a floating point when it comes to floating point i'm not going to go too much into the instructions I'm just gonna leave this here for you. I'm gonna go through it right now, just for a quick run over of some of the instructions um, that we're gonna use. We're gonna use SSE2. What does that stand for? Uh, single input, multiple data streaming extension to, I have no idea, something like that. Basically, this is like the oldest version of modern floating point numbers. We used to have a math coprocessor and you still do like for floating point stuff on your on your PC. But um, no one uses that stuff anymore. I'm not even sure compilers can even, I've, I have, well, maybe they can if it's some kind of flag, but I haven't seen any compiled code generate with those like floating point instructions from the good old days. Usually it will generate like um, SSE2 and newer AVX 512 or whatever. Basically um, it just, we have 128 bit wide registers into which we can fit two 64 bit floats and new stuff. And by the way, there are newer versions of this, which I'm pretty sure is on your computer right now as, as we speak, um, unless you have some kind of old garbage computer. Um, like you have YNM registers, which are twice as big. they are 256 bits wide. And you also have ZM registers, ZMM, which are 512, I believe. So you can fit so many floats into those. So you can do a lot of um, vectorized, like parallel processing of numbers. And there's a bunch of cool tricks with that. Um, we're gonna stick with XMM because it's simple, and this this series is not about going like, the, like the, the fastest you possibly can. It's about understanding what's going on, and this kind of is like laying the groundwork for all that. So that's that's the point of this series. So most of the instructions have couple, two variants. Obviously, there's add, divide, maximum, minimum, multiply, square root, subtract, and many others. Um, those are like arithmetic instructions, and basically you would pass in like to it two either 
XMM registers or you pick an XM register in our, in our memory location. And basically the idea is, you know, you can add to XMM1 what is in XMM2, or you can divide what's in XMM1 by some quantity at this memory location, the 128-bit memory location. So that's kind of how that works. And then the P and the S, so basically the, the D means double precision. There's also an S option for that. That means would that be like a single precision. So there's float. Float is four bytes. Double is eight bytes, or 32 bits for 64 bits. So yeah, D. We're gonna stick with um, doubles for everything. So everything will be a, a D at the end for this series. And so the P. That means packed. So that means like you got two numbers in there that I want to make sure that I'm adding two at a time, always, right? Versus S, S would just be the low, the low double precision number. So in general, we're probably just going to stick with the S, D versions of all these instructions. So we're going to do add S, D, div S, D, max S, D, min S, D, mol S, D, screw S, D, and sub S, D. Uh, that's pretty much the gist of it. We may do some vectorization later on in the series where we're gonna do you know bigger and better things. But for the time being, that's good enough for us. Um, and then those are arithmetic instructions. And then you have a couple of different ways to move things around. So move SD is a way that you'd move a value between XMM registers, or you might move a value from memory into register. And if you wanted to move a value from like register RAX to XMM0, what you'd say is you say move Q XMM0 RAX. And that would basically move the quad word from RAX into XMM0. So that would also be a valid option. But yeah, that's how you move stuff. And the last kind of really important one, there's a few others like not and or and stuff, but com is D. So basically this just this is the compare instruction um, for scalar like single scalar double precision numbers so you can, you can compare quantities so let's say you had uh like five in this xm register and then four in this one you can compare five and four and then the certain flags would be set such that you could jump to a label in your code so you can then like check for tolerances i have an example that we'll, i'll show you in a few minutes we're going to use the commas instruction so you'll see then how it works so yeah, this is pretty much um, everything we're gonna do in terms of programming floating point in this entire series. This one slide covers that. All right, so what are the pros and cons? So I got three categories here. Oh, can you see the bottom piece? Yeah, you can. So I got floating point, I have fixed point, and I have a custom implementation, which could be like any number of the things we, we talked about before, like fractions or flags or whatever so floating point is a great because it just works like you can just plug and chug numbers in uh, nasm the assembler already knows how to generate floating point numbers you can define a quad word like 1.5 and it will automatically convert that to that really complex looking gobbledygook like this like it will automatically generate that for you so it's, it's really cool so it just everything just works you can you can add numbers like it's so easy to do also, there's a really fast hardware implementation of really complex things. So like, for example, square root SD, see that instruction over here, square root SD, that, that's a hardware implementation that it would be really hard to implement that in software and also really slow. So if you want to implement square root for fixed point numbers and custom numbers, you might be in trouble. Um, so, but yeah, it exists for floating point. Also, you can easily vectorize things in floating point. You have those single instruction, multiple data, or whatever it's called. So you can be really fast. You can do operations on, you know, two, four, eight things at once. More if you use single precision, right? The problems are, hey, there's a minimal clever tricks. Like there's a bunch of cool tricks you can do with fixed point numbers. You can you can shift fixed point numbers to divide them by powers of two, right? or multiply them by powers of two, things like that. Little tricks up your sleeve. Um, so yeah, that's that's an issue. Also, you have to jump through hoops to do simple things. Like even printing a number out to the screen, floating point number, it's not trivial. I have to implement a whole like 
log, natural log and log base 10 algorithm, I want to show you that right now. It's just not easy. It's super easy to implement printing a fixed point number. It's just a, it's super easy, it's just powers of two. So you can do that like in, in your head. And super easy to print out fractions and stuff. It's just numerator, denominator, integers. Floating point, you gotta figure out how to parse this thing or, or something like that, or you have to actually do math and constantly be recomputing. That's what we're gonna re be doing in this video. So yeah, it's just a big mess. And uh, also I would say it's the least memory efficient option. You're wasting those 11 bits on exponent when uh, normally your problems, at least in my field, are very well bounded. We don't go above 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 15th maybe. And so we can do everything in terms of fixed point with way better precision on, on that end. Now fixed point though, it kind of just works. Certain things work. Obviously fixed point is just an integer implementation. So you can add 0.5 and 0.5 in the same way that you would add one and one and it just works. So that's kind of cool. Um, there are a lot of clever tricks you can do for fixed point in terms of sneaky math tricks. And also there are, it's a pretty efficient use of bits because there's no waste on that 11 bit exponent that you have for floating point. Now, some things can be vectorized in fixed point. Not everything, but some things can. The problem is you don't, be, you don't have the ability to represent really small numbers unless you pick, like you can't have both small, really small numbers and really big numbers in the same math. It won't work. You don't have the ability to do that. And also you still have to jump through some hoops to do simple things. Now, what about a custom implementation like a fraction or something like that? This is super application specific. So you can pick like the perfect one for the job. You can have it be super fast because it's all going to be like tricks. You have an, maybe an implied denominator that you don't have to even define because you know what it's going to be. Like so many shortcuts you can take. It's probably a more efficient use of bits in most cases. Um, and there are a huge number of clever arithmetic tricks you can do. And also you can encode other stuff. Like remember when we had map encoding north, east, south, and west, you could encode additional information into your you know, bit stream or whatever you want to call it into your register for additional characteristics of whatever you're talking about. The problem is you have to implement it yourself every time. You can't just plug and chug like floating point. You got to implement this each time for a unique problem. And then you may not be able to use those fast hardware implementations like square root, like I mentioned, and also convoluted stuff. Like if you had some really complicated, you know, bit pattern, like these are numerator, this is the denominator, this is the flag, this is the shift, this is the fixed point, like everything scrambled together, um, it would probably be slow. <laughs> it would be cool, but it would probably be very slow. So there's pros and cons to all these different three. You can pick the one for the job. And people will say, oh, floating point is the best, it's the fastest. People will like, we will even smack talk fixed point, I've noticed on forums. It's like, are you an idiot? So I have a speed test I'm gonna show you guys. Um, basically, I'm sure you guys can see, oh, let me get rid of this so you can see, there we go. So I implemented a simple bisection algorithm, like, you know, like a root finding type thing uh, to compute square root of two. I did the same exact implementation on a fraction implementation. So I did a fractional number representation. I did a fixed point implementation. I did a floating point implementation. And I used the same algorithm, the same memory accesses, the same alignment. Everything is like copy and paste exactly the same. And you'll see, and I can show you this you know, in a second, or you can run it yourself on your machine and you can see um, the fraction runs the fastest by quite a bit. I, I did 100 million iterations of computing square root of two with a bisection algorithm to, I think it was like seven or eight decimal places um, within 2.35 seconds. It was 2.5 seconds for a fixed point implementation. And then lastly, floating point, way behind, like three times as slow. Um, even with fancy tricks like this, I was, I was unable to get even close to the other two implementations. So it's not always the fastest. Yes, you can vectorize it. Yes, you can parallelize it. Yes, you can just plug and chug. Yes, it has these hardware accelerated type instructions, but it won't always be the fastest for the job at hand. This is one, I just wanna let you guys know that. Maybe it is sometimes, 
but maybe not all the time. That's what I'm trying to say. All right, so in this video, I'm going to talk about a few different examples. I'm just going to brush through them because it's so much stuff. I, I can't even, it would take me an hour. So we're talking about printing floats as well as printing them with scientific notation. Also printing a fixed point number as well as some speed tests that I just showed you before. So let's hop into the code right now. I hope you guys can see. So here are those examples. Um, it's in example seven in the Soy Hub suppository. So I'm gonna get right into the, um, let me think, how should I do this? Let's go to the speed test first, actually. So let's go to example uh, D. That's the speed, speed test with floats. So let me open up the code for you. Let me show you how, how this works. So I have basically an algorithm here called floating point bisect. That's just the bisection algorithm with floats. So you can see here, these are those floating point instructions that I mentioned before. Here you can see I'm moving values. So I'm using XMM1 and XMM2 for the bounds of the bisection algorithm. You know, that's how you do it. You have two bounds and you move them in halfway each time. Uh, you iterate through until you converge on a, on a tolerance that you set. So here you can see I'm checking the bounds. I'm moving the upper bound into the XMM3. Stretch, subtracting off the lower bound, and then I'm comparing it versus the tolerance. And if we're below it, I say we're done, you can return. Here you can see I'm, I have the algorithm implemented, so I'm using move, add, multiply, etc. instructions to do that. I won't go through the details of the algorithm, you can figure that out yourself. And um, yeah, when I return, I, I basically loop this 100 million times, and then I print out the float. So if I save that and I, let me just compile that first. Now I have a binary that I can run. Let me time the binary. You guys can see how long it takes in real time. So yeah, 100 million implementation, 100 million iterations. We're going down, I think to, it was, um, it was, you can see it took 6.8 seconds to run. I was going to a tolerance of this. So whatever that value is. And I mentioned before that you can define numbers in NASM in floating point sense. All you have to do is this. So you want to define the number one, you just say DQ, that means define quad word 1.0. You can't just do one, that would be just the integer one. You have to do 1.0. And also pro tip, you can't just do like 0.5. If you want to do 0.5, you couldn't do it because they would think that's a label because labels start with a point. So you'd have to do 0 0.5, but anyway, um, 1.0, and then you can define a tolerance 0 0.0000001, etc. So that's how that works. Um, no big deal. Let's go to the other ex uh, examples here. Uh, was it E for the fixed speed test? Now this code, I'll show you how I implemented the fixed point number. So here you can see, I have these weird definitions. I have a quad word of like, what's that, 16 million and 33 million, what is this? Basically, these are just one shifted 24 and one shifted 25. So I basically, I said, hey, my fraction is gonna be 24 bits, and then the other 40 bits are gonna be my integer part of the number. The decimal point is not at the right, it's 20 bits in from the right, or 24 bits in from the right, I should say. And yeah, it's the same algorithm, but the beauty of this is that you can see it's all integer instructions. There's no SD. We're just moving integer values and we're subtracting them and adding them. And here we see we can shift them because this is one of those, those tricks, right? I can shift the integer right or left to basically do division by two. So yeah, it's just an application specific cheat code that we can implement here. Anyway, that's that, same story, um, same algorithm, same alignment, see the align directives there? Um, that basically helps the code go a little bit faster. I won't talk about that in this video. Um, if I run this, Oops, just to compile, and then I have a binary, and then I time that binary, you can see it will be presumably a little bit faster. Here it says 2.6 seconds, so way faster, four seconds faster than before. Um, same implementation, same tolerance, right? Look at the code. The tolerance here, well, I guess I didn't, didn't show you, but it's, it's the same level of tolerance here. Um, tolerance fixed, one, so basically, we know we shifted the decimal point 24 to the left. Well, this means even with that 24 decimal point shift, one is our tolerance. So one shifted right, 24 would be our tolerance. So it's a, it's a small fraction. 
So that's cool. Um, let's go to the other example. That was F. This is a fractional implementation. So let me show you how this works. Let's look at the code. In this case, I don't have any memory. I'm not accessing any memory. Everything's happening in registers. So I basically have a register for numerator and for denominator. I won't get into the details, but here's the algorithm. You can see how it's very like weird and condensed and there's like we're using add and shifting as opposed to multiplying. It's all wonky. It's just an application specific solution to the problem, right? So if I close this, run it to compile, oops, I keep doing that. Now I have a, a binary to run. If I time that binary, it should be faster than even the fixed point. You can see here, it's just a, a shred of a second faster. So yeah, you can see there's different ways to solve problems and maybe floating point isn't the fastest way for every problem. Maybe it is for some problems, maybe not for other problems. So yeah, now let's talk about some other things. So in this folder, I also have stuff to print numbers out. So let me talk about printing floats out. But let me just run the code just to begin with here. Because it's, it's so much stuff. So um, let me just run the code. Here you can see I'm printing out like, basically the number is one, two, three, four, point five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I'm just printing it out with different amounts of significant figures and different amounts. And then I'm shift, I'm dividing it by 10 every time. So this first row is that number with, I think it's nine significant bits, then eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. And by bits, I mean digits. I don't mean bits as in zero and one, I mean, I mean digits. So nine significant digits in base 10. And you can see with eight digits, I rounded that eight there to a nine, seven significant digits, I run that seven there to an eight, et cetera. Pretty cool, right? And then I divide it by 10, you kind of can see how these things all generate, and it's not easy. If this is a very complicated algorithm. I think when I first did this, it took me like a month to implement this, a month. So I'm not gonna talk about that all in this video. I'm gonna talk about maybe a few things here and there, but not the full details. And then at the bottom, the hardest part is, uh, is base 10 numbers. Like, I, I don't know why, I mean, I, I do know why I'm not gonna explain it, but the numbers, multiples, powers of 10 are like re kind of a lot harder. <laughs> you have to use a, a, a lookup table to help you with these ones, because it's just, you might have a little bit of inaccuracy and then it, it won't count. Like if, you have, if you're one bit off, it won't count. It'll be a 9.9, .9, right? And everything will be messed up. So also at the bottom here, we, we have um, special cases. So in floating point numbers, you can check the Wikipedia article, there's a couple special numbers, plus or minus zero, as well as plus or minus infinity, and then NAN. NAN stands for not a number. Um, so yeah, that's... Now, what you could have as other options as well. And this print routine can handle all possible numbers. So positive numbers, negative numbers, special numbers, everything everything works out. Let's go into the code. Actually, hold on, let me open up the other, other stuff too. So code, and then let's open up the print float, as well as, oh my God. This is so bad, I should have done this before. Um, lib math expressions log. Okay, yeah, it's it's just not easy. I'll tell you right now, it's not easy. So I have a, let me go to the actual code first. So in this code, I'm basically just looping through different numbers and I'm just calling this function print float with a, a float in XMM zero. So, and then a number of sig figs in RSI. So here's that function, print float. Again, it takes in a file descriptor to print out to. It takes the number in XMM zero and then also takes the um, number of digits that you care about, let me say nine or seven or whatever in RSI. And it's not easy. You can see we're including a function right off the bat. We're including this log base 10 function. And that's to figure out the power of the number. So what's the log base 10 function? This is a, basically, it uses a lookup table or a Taylor series approximation to compute the power of a number. You see how this is getting way too complicated? Simple things are just so hard in, in floating point. And so here I have this massive lookup table of all the powers of 10, just in case you put one in, massive lookup table. And then I got, uh, in the case where it's not in the lookup table, you eventually have the option to call log base E, so natural log. That is this function here, 
And this is basically we have algorithms for Taylor series for the natural logarithm. And so we're basically solving for the natural logarithm and then converting it back with the inverse log of 10, etc. It's just a huge mess. Look at the code if you want. Um, and it's just, it's just so much garbage. And you have big numbers, you have small numbers, you have medium sized numbers. It's just not easy. Um, so I won't get into too much detail about that. You can look it up and you can have the code. The code is yours, public domain, take it and run with it. I don't care. So that works. Now, what about the scientific notation? So I have another copy of that same code, um, that same like thing with a scientific notation based solution because as engineers, we tend to have this most of the time. Here you can see I've got the same numbers as before, just with this E notation that means times 10 to the power of. So long story short, it's just the same stuff with exponential you know, notation in it. Okay, cool. So let me go to the last example, and that was printing out the fixed numbers. So that's example C. Of course, I can't open a folder in BIM uh, and do anything useful, so I should have gone in there like this. I'm so stupid. Okay, here you can see. I want to first show you the number that I've picked for fixed point. I've picked this dot x memory location to contain two bytes. Actually, when I load it, it's going to have eight bytes, but the low byte is going to be this fraction, 0x01, and I'm implying a denominator of eight here. That's the number of bits that I don't that are not integer bits, they're bits for the, the, the for the fraction. And so this basically encodes as one over two to the eighth as the fractional part, and then I have 0x80, that byte encodes 128. And so this quantity is 128 and 1 256. That's the fixed point representation, assuming you have an offset of that fixed point of 8 bits. And basically how this works is I basically just, um, I load that into a register and I print it out and then I divide it by 2, 17 times and I print it out every time. So let's run that and see how it looks. So the first number is that number, it's 128 plus one over 256. And again, this is this is not hard. This implementation is literally just, what's the integer part and what's the fraction part? In fact, I'm gonna open it up for you so you can see how much easier this is than the floating point, just to get your mind in the right zone here. So um, that's in lib io print fixed of course i'm an idiot as usual so this print routine literally it takes the value the, the value in rsi with with an implied denominator in rdx and then it just literally prints the integer part prints the plus symbol and prints the numerator prints the division symbol and print the denominator. It's not hard compared to the log base 10 lookup table, blah, 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 blah. Crap. This is way easier, right? So yeah, I run this, you can see that number. Then that number divided by two, it just shifts the whole thing to the right by one bit. And you can see our fraction got killed. It got shifted out of the number. So you can see we got 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1, 0. With now we have half of one. And you can see, again, we go down down the list, right? And now let's show you with negative numbers, just really quick, it's very simple. Actually, first, let me show you with um, multiplying by two instead of dividing by two. So shifting left instead of right. You can see our first number, and then you can see every number is twice as big, right? Let's go back in the code, put it back the way it was. Now let's do negative numbers. So that same expression, also works for negative numbers. That same representation. Here you can see our, our number negated. Here you can see it being shifted by down every single time. And you can see just because the way rounding works, um, it actually rounds up every time as opposed to being rounding down. But that's just how negatives work in, uh, in, in binary. So pretty cool stuff. And then lastly, let's, let's uh, turn back on the multiply by two thing just because you can see this number growing and growing and growing, bigger and bigger and bigger. So yeah, with that out of the way, um, 
I'm pretty much done. That's the whole video. This is, like I said, it's a gateway to the rest of this series. Um, so now that you see that there's a pro and con to floats and to fixed point and to a random implementation, you can take this and go implement your own algorithms in engineering with the best possible solution that you could come up with. All right. Thanks for watching, guys. Have a nice day.